idea that we choose to forget that this stuff ever happened. We choose to forget that which makes us uncomfortable. It's easier not to remember. Uh, this image, I'm, I'm a big movie fan. I teach a class African American history for film. I love movies, and one of my favorite movies, historical movies, is Glory. And this is Denzel Washington playing the character Trip in the film, in the movie Glory, 1989, about the African American all black regiment in Massachusetts 54. Really powerful film. Uh, but it has its flaws. One of its flaws is that black abolitionists are almost totally silenced. Frederick Douglass. Uh, who was one of the leading abolitionists, the driving force behind not only the Emancipation Proclamation and getting Lincoln on board with fighting against slavery, but the driving force behind the Massachusetts, Mass the Massachusetts 54 has four words. Frederick Douglass said more than four words when he was born. You couldn't shut up, Frederick Douglass. <laughs> and yet in Hollywood, we have, we have silence. Them. But there's a scene in the movie that is really telling me where uh, the black troops go down south, and then they're, they're commanded by uh, 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 Robert Gould Shaw, or Robert Gould Shaw, a uh, white commander, and he encounters a, uh, a fellow Union officer, but this Union officer is from Kentucky, Shaw is from Massachusetts, and the Union officer says, again, this is how we remember our past. The Union officer says, it is hard to imagine, no, he says, it is impossible to imagine slavery in Massachusetts. And then they just simply ride off. It's impossible to imagine slavery in Massachusetts. Guess what? No, it's not. <laughs> it is absolutely not impossible to imagine slavery in Massachusetts, or in New York, or in Rhode Island, or in New Hampshire, because it existed there. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Slavery existed in New York, in the state of New York, until 1827. That's just 30 years before the Civil War. Some of the wealthiest enslavers in America lived in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. It is absolutely not impossible to imagine slavery in Massachusetts. Only in our imaginations is it. Because we want to forget this past. Look, that's a distinctly northern thing. I'm in Ohio now. And Ohio suffers from underground railroad-itis. <laughs> The students come into class, the students come into class, and they're so excited. I said, let's talk about slavery. They're like, oh, Ohio, Underground Railroad. We're on the right side of history. And they pretend as though all of them and everybody in Ohio was down with the Underground Railroad, was down with resistance to slavery. And I'm like, if everybody was so down with the Underground Railroad, it wouldn't have been underground. <laughs> like, what are y'all talking about? And they're like, yeah, but Dr. Jeffries, you know, Ohio didn't have slavery. And I was like, you know why? Because they didn't want black people in the state. <laughs> this is what they're saying in the state of conventions. They're not like, yeah, it's a terrible slaves are terrible things, these are former slaveholders. We're like, we don't want the competition, labor competition. They believe as deeply in white supremacy as anybody in the South. But our historical amnesia drops that off. So the second way we deal with it, if we don't just pretend it didn't exist, the second way we deal with it is we rationalize evil. Right. We rationalize evil. This is a picture of Thomas Jefferson, a painting, a portrait of Thomas Jefferson, uh, and, and the, close, the, the closest thing that we have to an image of Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings was a slave woman, enslaved Thomas Jefferson. Uh, also, Sally Hemings was uh, his, his first wife's half-sister. Sally Hemings was enslaved and Thomas Jefferson and has and bears six children, six, seven children by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is 44 years old when he begins this relationship with Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings is 14. Mm. And he owns her. There's no parts of that mm. that can be based on love and mutual respect because the power imbalance is too great. 
but we rationalize it. Thomas Jefferson loved her. They just married young back then. <clears throat> what? They weren't married. What are you talking about? Rationalize evil. This is, this is me too before we get me too. If you, go to, if you go to any of these presidential mansions, presidential estates, and you ask, and I work a lot with uh, the docents and the interpreters there, and I love to ask this so what's the number one question uh, that you get, or the response that you get uh, when you share with visitors that Thomas Jefferson, or James Madison, uh, or George Washington, enslaved people, owned people. That's the number one response that you get. And to a person they will say, that the visitor will say, but wasn't he a good master? <laughs> but wasn't he a good owner? Help me understand what good is in this context. Mm. If you are claiming ownership over people, I don't care if you are Jesus Christ himself, you have compromised your humanity. You were trying to rationalize evil. Wasn't he a good master? There's an old WBA narrative. Somebody asked a former enslaved person, uh, could you define a good master? And he said the only good master was a dead master. <laughs> hmm. But here we are in the 21st century rationalizing evil. And the third part is creating false narratives. Mm -hmm. And this is the Confederate monument from right after lunch. I ran outside and took a picture. <laughs> I didn't really do that because it's all over the internet. Yeah. Of, of the monument that you have uh, right here in the square. Mm -hmm. So we either pretend something didn't happen, we rationalize it away, or we conjure up a false narrative. We conjure up a false narrative. And part of the, as we were talking about this, it's like, look, this is one of the earliest, you know, Confederate monuments that went up. So this isn't part of the lost cause mythology that slavery wasn't sort of the source and principal cause of the Civil War. It's like, this is St. Augustine. Y'all always start stuff first. Speak true, sir. <laughs> the mythology of the lost cause begins almost immediately mm -hmm. after the war ends. Mm -hmm. Almost immediately, not in the form of statues, not in the form of monuments, but look at the way people begin almost immediately talking about Robert E. Lee and the deification of Robert E. Lee. That's the beginning of this lost cause narrative. Mm -hmm. That this was some noble venture. This was treason. And I thought treason was a problem up until most recently. Right, 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 right. Right. But apparently not. True. But we also have to connect this community of St. Augustine to what this actually represents. Because while your monument, and as long as it stands here, is yours, while your Confederate monument was early in the 1870s, most don't come up until the 1890s and to early 19 teens. And it's a very re there's a very clear reason why. Mm. Because this was a moment in which you had a resurgence in white supremacy. Right. And in violent white supremacy in response to African American political organizing and, and agitation for economic and basic social and civil rights. The reason why these monuments go up, and, and as historians, this is the thing. People say, well, well how do you know this? Like, the people said it themselves. Right. Like, I'm not making this stuff up. You go look at the dedication speeches. Yeah. Right. And they're like, this is a monument to white supremacy. <laughs> and, and what are we supposed to ask? Well, what do you mean by white supremacy? White supremacy, that's what I mean, white supremacy. A racial hierarchy, a justification for the exploitation of black labor, for the use of violence to discriminate, the use of violence to maintain a social hierarchy. This is occurring at the same time as Birth of a Nation makes its national debut and is being shown not just in California and, and in the South, but in 
the, in Washington, D.C., and the presidents in the White House, in Massachusetts, and in Chicago. White supremacy, in this moment in time when these Confederate monuments are being littered around the country, the, the greatest participation trophies that Americans have ever come up with. Mm, there you go. It serves as a sort of national unifying event, phenomenon. Yes, sir. And to signal to black people That's it. that their place is not one of equality, but of any inequality. That's, it. That's, yes. it. That's what those monuments represent. There's no getting around that. And the people were clear about it at the time. And it's not a coincidence that, coincidence that this is also occurring at the same time as you have a resurgence, natural resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan right. and racial terror organizations. And again, this isn't just a Florida thing. This isn't just an Alabama thing. This is also Indiana and Ohio. Mm -hmm. This is a national thing. So that's the first wave when we see these Confederate monuments going up that are pushing forward this false narrative about what the past was. The second time, the second wave, is in the 1950s and 